Welcome to World Wood Day 2021, Fire in the West. My name is Steve Ambrose and I'm a retired Forest Service employee who volunteers for the International Wood Culture Society, who sponsors World Wood Day. The International Wood Culture Society brings people throughout the world together to talk about forests and woods and the culture behind it. In the last few decades, wildfire in the United States has been a more serious problem. It has caused destruction of not only our forests and our resources, but property and lives as well. Since 2020, an annual average of 70,600 wildfires has burned an annual average of 7 million acres, which is double the average in the 1990s. In cooperation with the Rocky Mountain Research Station of the Forest Service, the International Wood Culture Society is developing videos to help explain what's happening in the West as it relates to wildfires. Let me introduce our participants today. Jessica Bruin is a science delivery and public affairs specialist for the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Momo Shaw, video editor and program coordinator for the International Wood Culture Society. Today, we also have Dr. Charlie Luce to talk about climate change and fire. Charlie is a research hydrologist for the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Boise, Idaho. He works on a range of subjects related to forest water relations and aquatic ecosystems in forests, including climate change, snow hydrology, drought, wildfire occurrence and effects, forest roads, and groundwater, surface water interactions. Thank you for being with us today, Charlie. The floor is yours. Thanks for the kind introduction, Steve. So I'll be talking about wildfire and climate relationships in the Western US. And what I'll be reporting on is a result of collaborations, many led by others, including this great group of people down here, Zach Holden, Moji Sade, Matt Jolly, uh, Mohammed Alzade, John Abatsiglou, and many others who contributed to all of this work. So it's really been a huge team effort, and there are many other researchers working on a related subject as well. So I have a, a bit of a uh, focused contribution here just on mostly the set of contributions. As Steve just mentioned, wildfire area has been increasing across the West and on the the left axis there, it's actually a log scale. So we're going from tens of thousands up to millions of acres since the mid 19 from the mid-1980s to currently. And the, the map on the right shows the distribution of acres across the West, just to give a sense of things. This map has changed dramatically even in the last five years. So this picture was 1984 to 2015, or I guess now six years. There's been a lot more fires in California, for instance, if you've been following the news. There are four ideas that people have about why wildfire has been increasing in the West in recent times. One of those has been the increased fuel left behind because of past wildfire suppression efforts that have prevented the burning of, of forests. There's another set of three there, reduced snowpack, warmer air temperatures, driving evaporative demand, and reduce summer precipitation as potential mechanisms being driven by the climate. So I'd like to separate the first one out because it's less climate related and more fact of or discussion of history. Here's a picture and or a pair of pictures and there could be in a present place, but these were just a couple that were taken here in Boise and in our historical photo archives that show the current situation fairly well. Uh, the 1913 picture shows what's a fairly classic open park-like stand of ponderosa pine and, and other thick bark species like Douglas fir, and a forest floor underneath that that's been maintained by fire. And if you look in there, you can actually see a log across there that has some char on it, some burn marks partway up the stems. But the trees themselves are fine, and underneath there's very little fuel load. By 1931, we see a good crop of small, younger trees growing up underneath those from the same photo point. Ultimately, in 1931, this stand did burn, and later these trees were just dead because of the large accumulation of fuel beneath them. So those trees underneath, when they dried out, were enough to carry things up into the canopy. That's a situation similar to what many stands are like in some of the lower elevation places in the West. So these are what we call a dry forest type. 
And these are places where frequent but sort of non-severe wildfires, what we call the lighter fires, they're not killing the trees, but they maintain low fuel conditions near the forest floor. And then those larger trees can go on living for quite some long time with just occasional fires affecting them. The reason that I want to set this aside in part in terms of looking at about what's going across the West is here we see the map of just the Northern Rockies. And here's the distribution of where the wildfires burn and what kinds of forests they burn in. Here's the dry forest. And as you see, a lot of them aren't particularly severe. The hatching here indicates severe fire. And then, but if we look over here to the cold forest, uh, there were several times more area burned and quite a bit more of that as severe wildfire. And so the, the big changes that have gone on and the big acreages that we've seen across much of the West really are sitting here in this high cold forest, which is a different forest type and has quite a bit more climate control on what's going on in those forests. And so while the, the impact of fuel management and past uh, fire suppression is a very important fact and situation in the dry forests of the West, which are quite widespread, um, there's still this climatic effect that's very much driving what's going on in the cold forests. So if we look at these climate drivers, there are three mechanisms that I just men mentioned. One idea is that there's earlier snow melt reducing fuel moisture. The second idea is that the warmer temperatures, which help with the evapotranspiration, reduce the fuel moisture. And the fourth is that fire season precipitation regulates the fuel aridity and fire season precipitation events, the number of events is decreasing. So let's just go more deeply into that second mechanism. And this is one of the most widely cited papers on the subject. And it's the idea that reduced snowpack yields a longer fire season. So if you have less snow accumulation, it melts a bit earlier. And so we see a shift in the timing of the snowpack melting and a shift in runoff that's shown in the, the middle there. And then that correlates fairly well in terms of how much wildfire is going on at the same time. But there are questions about that. So one example here is the Yellowstone fires in 1988, which really were near the beginning of this big trend across the West. And in fact, if you just look at the, the wildfires in the Northern Rockies, those Yellowstone fires were a big number in there. And you can see this very large burned area there in 1989 and then the recovery since into 2011. The question comes about when we start looking at the details of that year. This is the records from a, what's called a snow tail station where we measure precipitation and temperature and snowpack patterns all at the same time. The snowpack patterns here are in blue and then the precipitation information is in here in red on the top graph. Then on the bottom, we have the temperature and what's Really important here is to look at what's going on through the main part of the year when the snowpack should be accumulating. One is that the, the precipitation and the snowpack accumulation are both you know, just doing fairly well. The snowpack here is in blue, the precipitation's in red in the upper graph. And through that particular 1988 winter, the precipitation was normal, the snowpack accumulation was normal. And we actually look at the temperatures and it was about 10 degrees below normal. But then when we go and look late into the season, we see that essentially in May, it stopped raining. And that was an important clue that maybe there's something beyond the snowpack changes that might be going on. The top line here in red shows what the, on average, the rainfall usually does through the summer. And usually Yellowstone gets quite a bit of rain and number of rain events on through the summer. So that was a very anomalous summer in that sense. The second mechanism, again, fairly easily related to climate change, is that they're warming summer temperatures and that those increase the evaporative demand. And it's actually, as shown in the graph here, a very nonlinear function. So this vapor pressure deficit is what's at hand there. And that tells us how dry the air is and how much it's able to potentially grab from the fuel is the sense of it. The third climate-related idea here, mechanism four, is that we have reduced summer wetting producing drier fuel. So fewer rain events during the summer or the longer time between rainfall events is another way to look at it. And what that says is if you don't get the wood wetted occasionally, the fuel becomes drier. And both the, the warm weather and the dry weather ideas are probably familiar to anyone who likes storing up their firewood for the winter. They try to keep it dry and nice warm summers. 
they'll dry it out and season it even better. So fairly simple, intuitive notions there. And again, a very strong relationship between the number of wetting rain days and area burn. So all these things relate well. And here's been the trend in the summer precipitation occurrence. That's a little less intuitive to many people. You know, warmer, drying things out more is certainly, people are used to that idea. But what's been going on is shifts in how air holds moisture that change how the summer precipitation is, is occurring and how, and then the dynamics of where the wind blows moisture through the atmosphere during the summer months. And so if we look on the left, we see the general trend historical from 1979 to 2016 and how many wedding rain days there are. And then the other graph on the right is the actual trend in how the wedding, wedding rain days are happening through the summer averaged across that whole space. And we see a strong trend in the average and a very strong signal, especially in the northern half of the Western US, but also across much of the west, rest of the US. And it's probably been even a bit stronger more recently in the California area. So one way that we can do this is just do a multiple regression and look at the relative influence of these three different potential processes to evaluate how each of them plays a role in the total wildfire area burn. And what we see is evidence for the fact that fire season precipitation is really the strongest signal here. It's almost twice as strong as a signal being derived from the evaporative demand increases. Both of these are very important. Now, in contrast, the snowpack hypothesis isn't holding up nearly as strongly as either of those. Certainly, it goes in the right direction. So there's a, a negative relationship. A more snowpack means less wildfire area burned. But for the most part, this is just not all that considerable, despite its early adoption as an idea. And these two more recent ideas from the 2017, 16, and uh, 2018 publications really have been a, a bit different of a picture in that. Another way to think of the number of wedding rain days in the summer months is a longer time between rainfall events. And certainly people who have been out fighting wildfires out on the fire lines and thinking about it, you know, one of the questions is when's the next rainfall event coming because we're not going to be able to put out this fire until the rain comes and helps put it out. Besides drying out fuels, the time between rainfall events is pretty important to how far a wildfire tends to spread. And on the left is the history of the mean consecutive rain-free period. And on the right is a picture of the expected potential future change driven by climate change. And we see you know, broadly in similar directions, except in the area of Nevada and parts of Utah, which have historically been experiencing things, but are not expected to as much in the future. So what's interesting is here, when we look at a, you know, something like a 20% change in the number of consecutive dry days, if we start thinking about, say, a month of dry days, you might be thinking of, for say, one particular location, that a one month of dry days happens about once in 10 years. Now, if we change that by 20%, what that is saying is no longer something that happens once every 10 years, but once something that happens once every three and a half years. So we're seeing more extremes more frequently in many parts of the West. And certainly in the Northwest, a number of record periods of consecutive dry days that haven't occurred as they have in the past. So it's been quite a change and it's expected to continue in similar directions. Along with just more area burned, what's interesting is where that area is burned. Alluded to in some of my early plots, that show that it was a high cold forest where a lot of this change was going on. And the, the picture on the left shows the general pattern of what's expected to, or what has been going on, uh, an upslope drift of fire by about 800 feet. What that means is that many more additional forests that didn't used to burn except very rarely have been exposed to fire in recent years. And on the right shows the elevation change pattern. Some of the strongest changes are in the Northern Rockies, and uh, the Colorado Rockies and other parts of the Southern Rockies, as well as the, the Sierras and a bit in the Cascades. And here's the, the pattern, for example, for the Sierra Nevada. So it's a special statistical technique and you can see the trend from the 1980s to present in this upper 10th percentile of the forests and the elevation at which fires are occurring. So those fires are occurring if we start looking at just the, the highest edge of where those 
fires are occurring has been moving up over time. What's interesting is they intersect that then with the expected snow changes and what climate change is expected to do to snow. And the lower elevation snowpacks are the most vulnerable because they're warmer snowpacks. They're closer to zero degrees when they accumulate. So a bit of warming can tip them over that threshold. And as you get to colder and colder forests, they're more and more resilient to the expected coming changes. So if you change the mean winter temperature from minus 20 to minus 15 degrees Celsius, it's still very cold. Uh, but if you change it from minus two to plus three, it's a big change. And so the difference between being here in a warmer mountain range versus a colder one is a big difference. And again, it's these high cold forests where a lot of the fires have been occurring and spreading into, you wouldn't have expected climate change to be changing those snowpacks as much as they have here. So we would have expected to see a lot more fire here than we do out where we're actually seeing a lot of those changes in Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. And what those forests look like specifically is like this, so very different picture than those original opening scenes with the Ponderosa pine stands. And these are thin bark pines that are not resilient to even low fires traveling through. And fires in these might come back and visit historically every 200 to 400 years. So some of these lodgepole pine and subalpine fir stands uh, could certainly go for a long time without fire. And then the, the lodgepole pine are actually adapted to reseeding after the fire with serotonous cones and filling in those gaps. So they would live a long time without fire. And then when the fire occurred, they were adapted to reseeding those areas after that. And this is in a high elevation cold forest with a severe fire regime. And that's relevant in part to the question of how is hot fire severity changing along with the burned area. So the burned area has changed dramatically across much of the West. What's interesting when we look at fire severity is not as much change in how much is severe. Certainly there's a lot more severe fire just because there's a lot more fire, but the proportion of it that is high severity or even how severe it is, which is another measure here in the Parks and Abatsa Glue paper where they actually just measured the average severity and they also looked at the percentage that's in high severity. And this other paper on the right just looked at percentage of high severity. Here, they only saw a pattern in the Southern Rockies of increasing, these are these little bars going downward and we see that they get bigger and bigger magnitudes going down. And here in the Southwest, a very strong trend as well or in the, uh, in the trends. So these kind of match between these two papers that studied similar items. And then in the, the Northern Rockies, this paper on the left, the more recent one, has seen more trend than they did in the earlier paper for the Northern Rockies. But for the most part, the trends in severity, how much of it is high severity fire, are a little more muted, but they certainly are occurring more in these higher elevation mountains. So the upshot here is that precipitation decline and increased evaporation have increased wildfire together. And it's because of that, wildfire is burning in uncharacteristic locations, locations that have historically burned rarely, but more severely. So there's questions that sit out there. How will this adjust our fuel management strategy? Uh, it's a big, big area to think about as we start thinking about managing these wildfire fuels. And there's certainly new questions for how to think about climate change projections and climate change attribution of wildfires. Thanks, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much for your sharing. I think you mentioned something about low fire. Yes. So Can you kind of tell us, is there a like, difference between low fire and high fire? And like, how does forest fight against these kind of different kind of fires? Right, so some fires can burn along the ground. So say the, the pine needles fall down and there's a, a little bit of grass, sparse grass on the ground. Fires will creep across that and the flame lengths won't get very high and the soil won't get heated very strongly. Mm -hmm. And those fires, if they come up to the bark of a, a, a thick bark tree, won't kill that tree. Um, they'll just be leave a little bit of scorch mark on the outside of the bark and it won't harm the roots. And it'll move along, but it'll clean up a lot of fuels mm -hmm. uh, that are sitting on the ground. Uh, as opposed to fires that then move into, in those first two pictures, if you recall, there were, on the right-hand side, there were more trees going up higher. So that low fire could then move into smaller trees, which mm -hmm. can still be very dry. And then those smaller trees can actually 
build higher flame lengths that carry it up into the crown of the other trees. And that can become what's called a crown fire. And those are what are called ladder fuels that help bring the ground fire up into the canopy. And then that of course kills not just the small trees and the fuels that are on the ground, but also the, the larger trees. It'll, it'll kill all of them <laughs> and leave a, a scene like my closing scene uh, behind. So with the climate change, are we seeing more of these high fires rather than low fires? What's dependent there is the type of ecosystem we're in. So in a dry forest, frequent low fires and low severity, what are usually called low severity fires, um, every you know, five to seven years or something like that, um, keeps the fuels maintained in a condition that are, uh, there's very few fuels on the ground that would conduct it up into the canopy. And then in the other ecosystem that I showed near the end, where the trees are thin barked, uh, things like ponderosa pine and subalpine fir, what have you, those, when they do burn, have almost typically burn in a high severity fashion, so through the crown. Um, and you know, everything burns and conducts fairly well through that, or in a patchy way, so it might be a moderate severity fire, mm. um, where the, some of the trees are moist enough that they don't burn a great deal. But anyway, those, those are not forest ecosystems where the low ground fire typically occurs. And there's a lot of fuels that accumulate on the ground and they don't rot away very fast because they're in a cold, high mountain, elevate, high elevation place. So thinking about those two ecosystems, so certainly in the past, um, before we did a lot of fire suppression, those low elevation forests, drier forests, frequently had fires, often aided by indigenous fire practices to introduce fire into those forests. And then the higher elevation forests have only recently become dry enough because of the lost summer precipitation and warmer temperatures so that now they are burning more frequently. And so we have a little bit more severe fire also because once they start burning all of that fuel and canopy, they spread further and the weather that they generate helps them spread further. Mm. So it's a complicated question, I'm sure, too. <laughs> Well, it might have been a, a, a simple question, but it's, it's really a story of two different places. Right. Climate change is very much affecting the upper one. And certainly climate change is affecting the lower one, but our management has affected that one as well. Thank you. That was very clear. Thanks. So Charlie, um, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering with your research and your modeling work, how do you help national forest system land managers to manage their lands? with consideration to climate change? I try to learn all these complicated uh, patterns and simplify and make sense out of what can be a seemingly complex subject and communicate with and, and work with managers about how their concerns can be addressed. Another item is the new forest planning rules tell us that as we plan for the future of our forests, which go out for a long time when you're thinking about cutting down trees and planting a new stand of trees, you're thinking about 100 to 150 years into the future. So suddenly those 2080s projections of climate change are not these sort of, we'll worry about it when we get there kind of things because to a forester, we're there. When you plant that tree, you're thinking about 100 years in the future. So we need to, is the climate gonna be warmer? Is it gonna be drier? Is it going to be wetter? What kind of tree should I plant? Should I plant trees? <laughs> Should I just be planning on this being brush? And so it's thinking about how that's changing and then not just the trees, but the wildlife habitat in the future, what the water's gonna be doing, the streams. And so there's a lot to think about there and our public forests are responsible to the public in terms of saying, here's what we expect our future to look like on these forests. And the managers need to be able to communicate that information. And a fair amount of my work for the managers in recent past has just been developing what are called climate services products to help them understand what their expectations might be for the future and to communicate those to uh, the publics that they need to work with. Have you got any idea what's going to happen with climate change in terms of what you've, you've studied so far projecting into the future and how might that affect forest resources? That's a big question. So the future is going to be warmer. <laughs> 
that much is quite clear. And the physics are very sound and clear there. The whether it'll be wetter or drier is a question that's often brought up. And then what people don't realize and connect to in some sense, because there are certainly some subtleties in those on average. Uh, but if we start looking at the extremes, it'll be both wetter and drier. So we'll get more intense storms, more big downpour events going on into the future, uh, big footprint and volumes of rainfall, but they'll happen more rarely. And so we'll have longer drought times and those droughts will be warmer and able to evaporate more water. So we're gonna see both of those things and we're going to be seeing potentially more fire on the landscape. On average, we're gonna maybe get about the same amount of water and plants will be trying to use that water. Mm -hmm. So different plants are adapted to using the water at different speeds. Uh, grass can use water pretty rapidly. And so it may be well adapted to some of those situations where it can grab that moisture faster than another plant can, mm -hmm. for instance. But there's a lot of ecology to think about. And there's this interesting aspect that we are in the middle of a transition uh, as we go through climate change. It's not just that we're going to suddenly be in a new state, and so the plants can adapt to that new state, and our practices can adapt to that new state, but we're going to be changing. And as we change, uh, the ecosystems are going to be trying to sort out, uh, and it may not be a very graceful transition at all. And hopefully managers can help because we can have some inkling of what might be going on in the future, help those ecosystems transition more gracefully, I think would be the, uh, the way to think about that. And so uh, a future that is warmer and then both drier and wetter. And then what does that mean for the change in ecosystems that are gonna go with that will be the, the questions. And both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems are going to be affected by those kinds of changes. And uh, sadly enough for skiers and snowmobilers, uh, a lot less snow. You just mentioned that we're kind of in the transition mode right now. And I have read some information about like animals or plants, they actually would change their behaviors to adjust themselves into new environments. So have we seen something like that in the forest ecosystem? Have the scientists noticed any different behaviors from the forest or the animals, they have changed their behaviors in response to our climate change right now? That's a really good question. I don't know if the, the plants per se have adapted. Um, that's a, they, they don't move as much and, and movement is one of the questions. Certainly the wildfires are not an outcome <laughs> that the plants intend, but those are what we see on the landscape at the moment in terms of a transition and other plants dying. And then after fires, we're seeing in many places, less regeneration of trees and more of a return to shrub or grasslands, at least for a while after that disturbance. And so we see that kind of moving up the hillsides. I am a lot less versed in how animals have actually changed or migrated or moved. A colleague of mine, Dan Isaac, has been looking for the signal in fishes, and he studies stream temperature and stream flow and the effects of those on fishes and other aquatic species. And we've certainly seen some changes in what goes on to them as events like wildfires happen that have been really fascinating. But as far as systematic shifts in populations, that's what they're studying. And they have really advanced you know, genetic sampling tools to go and see where that's gone on. And I have not kept up on that literature. Um, and I, the first place I'd go for that would be to ask Dan, have the fishes moved? The, the other one, because he's been looking for that. And I know that even just a few years ago, he was saying, wow, we really need to do some work on this because people don't understand we don't have this in the literature, an actual, we've seen the habitat change mm -hmm. uh, that much. The, the trend has been obvious and wildfires, but are the plants and the animals going with it? The other one that's interesting is snow dependent species. Lynx, wolverine, uh, hoary marmot are all species that are of concern in the Northern Rockies. And then of course, the snowshoe hare. They've seen, for example, that the snowshoe hare has stayed white while the ground around it has turned brown. So it's mm. shift in seasonality. They don't know how it will adapt, how that species will adapt, or mm. if its range will just shrink to match the timing 
or if it has enough what's called phenological plasticity, i.e. will the individuals be able to adapt or is it something that eventually gets sorted out by Darwinian <laughs> so that those snowshoe hares that have a shorter season of being white uh, come out on top uh, over the others. And I think there's just a lot of understanding on those or will it just be a really hard road ahead for those snow dependent species? And again, I'm woefully unread on the subject. Based on you know the modeling and the mapping that you're doing for the Western United States, and probably beyond, is there any areas that are gonna escape the severity of climate change? Like, have you found any little pockets of hope where Mm -hmm. um, maybe they're just sitting in the right spot with the right conditions that they might not experience the severe end of climate change in the long run? I think we should think of it more in terms of some level of resilience to the changing climate. It will depend on how we actually manage to change our CO2 emissions over time. Uh, If we just keep going, then the CO2 keeps going up and the temperature keeps going up. Ultimately, everywhere is affected. The further north we go, we actually see more temperature sensitivity in northern latitudes than we do further south. But further south, it's already warm. So adding heat to that makes it even more challenging. One of the interesting things is this transition around snow and that at zero degrees you have snow in a sense and warmer than that you don't and below you do and so there's a bit in the mountains of resilience that I showed in the the map near the end that the higher elevation mountains have more resilient snowpacks the snow lasts longer there and its response to a warming climate is slowed It may take some years. It's a non-linear process Mm -hmm. up there. So the initial warming from minus 20 up to minus five for your average winter temperature, not a lot might happen, but you move past that and things are likely to happen a lot more rapidly. So if you're in the Cascades where it's already pretty warm, uh, the effects on snowpack are more dire. And then that cascades into effects on the air temperature and effects on stream temperature in those same areas. So those high mountain places are a bit more resilient than lower, ultimately affected for sure. But what's called the climate velocity, i.e. how fast climate change is moving up the mountains, actually slows down as you get higher and higher into the mountains. Mm -hmm. And that's been a big effect on stream temperature habitats, again, that my colleague Dan, Dan Isaac has done some nice work on. So if you're going to go skiing in the future, make sure you're in shape because it's going to be at higher elevations, say there in the Colorado Rockies, as opposed to in the Cascades. <laughs> the idea of dendrochronology, that's a fascinating science in itself. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how maybe that's reflected to climate change? Yeah, dendrochronology has been one of the best tools out there for understanding what is going on with climate change. And it's done all over the world and certainly all over the country. And those give many of our best records of drought and warming and temperature. And they give us a lot of context. So we've seen a change over time within the instrumental record that we have measuring. We've been seeing it get warmer and we've been seeing it in some places getting more dry and some places getting both drier and wetter and more drought has been a big story across the West where there's been a lot lot of dendrochronology work in the past number of years. And what the dendrochronology gives us is this answer to questions about is what we're seeing now just part of a natural cycle or is it something unique and separate? From what you can see of dendrochronology, we're, we're stepping outside the bounds of what we've seen in terms of temperature in the past In many places, we're seeing what changes compared to what we've seen in the past. We're either in a dry spell in a prolonged way that matches some of the driest spells uh, in the longest past that we have in the tree ring record. So we're, you know, this drought that we're facing in the West on average in the moment and looking in the uh, Colorado River Basin in particular has certainly been just the, you know, a long and deep drought question then of whether or not that particular drought is part of what they call the internal variability or internal cycles that go on on the planet could be there but where you know the odds are pretty thin at that stage 
But then what's really interesting is it augment the, that record with the ice cores. And every so often I get asked about you know, my experience with climate change. And I started in graduate school in the 1980s and I was actually studying glaciology during my undergraduate in 1983. And at that time, the, the Vostok ice cores had only gone partway down. And we were looking a few hundred thousand years into the past. And the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were, it was about 320. You know, flip my numbers there. <laughs> in any event, uh, parts per million. And so there were a lot of questions in the 1980s. And then we could see that those patterns, that we were a bit higher than anything seen in the past few hundred thousand years. Well, within a few years more, they are back 800,000 years. And you can see that the cycle had gone over and over again, but never quite as high in terms of carbon dioxide as what we were seeing then and moved up a bit more. And now we're, we're well over 400 parts per million. So taking all of these indicators together says that we are in a truly unusual space mm -hmm. that, you know, for temperatures, for carbon dioxide levels, in the atmosphere, and we know how those go together. That's pretty straight up physics. So it's all these clues from the past are really helpful in sorting out. And then I've had other colleagues who use ocean bed sediments do the same or lake bed sediments out there in some of those high cold mountains and the lakes in the Rockies where you can drill down and there's lots of pollen and there they can see how the species have varied over time. And yeah. that some of these, sometimes in the past, there have been droughts where these high elevation stands have been converted over to more ponderosa pine and Douglas fir, and then switched back and forth over time, just related to drought. But we're seeing ourselves in certainly, in some ways, unprecedented temperatures and temperature with hot patterns than we have in the past. To some extent, we've had very big fire systems in the past with the Denver chronology that they've been able to detect. And they can tie that pretty well to it's, you know, when it's dry and comparatively warm. Uh, that tends to be the case. And then we find ourselves at the far edge of warm and dry compared to what we've seen over many, many millennia into the past. Going back to dendrochronology, can you explain the process in terms of understanding the climate? Okay, so here's the hydrologist perspective on dendrochronology. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll miss some of the important details, but you can take a tree core like the picture behind Momo there, or a tree disc like that and look at the yes the tree rings on that and the width and those individual tree rings across there and certainly anybody who's been out in the woods around a, a stump has counted tree rings across there and seen that some are wide and some are narrow mm -hmm. and depending on where you are why a tree has wide versus narrow rings varies and can tell you about the climate of that tree depending on where it lives so trees that are in the dry end of the spectrum respond a lot to moisture. And so from those, we can tell when it's been wet versus dry. Mm -hmm. uh, trees at high elevations, you know, they have better growing seasons when it's warmer. And it may not tell you that much about whether it's uh, dry or not. Uh, it might tell you about the winter precipitation versus the summer. But anyway, you can get different information from trees in different parts of the landscape. And then the other aspect is there are some things that bring these all into synchrony. So they also can use and go backwards with dead trees back through time by matching patterns of wide and narrow and wide and narrow and wide and narrow to know when sort of a tree was born, when it died and match up records. So you can go even deeper into the past than just the lifespan of an individual tree. Mm -hmm. And so it's combining all of these clues and pieces together to tell us how the climate has varied in the past. When you're talking about how drastic the temperature has been changing over the years, and like right now we know the climate change is a global issue, and of course it affects so many places, but how come it seems like it's bringing much stronger impact to the west part of the USA? Is, then is that why we are seeing more wildfires there in recent years? So yeah, why is the impact just in the western US at the moment? Why are we just beginning to see it there? I think it's in part because it's at sort of the dry edge of things anyway. So the Western US has always been known to be a relatively dry space in the broad scheme. Certainly the high mountains seem damper because with the snowpack coming later into the year and it gets the orographic enhancement, 
But if you take the West as a whole, it's a dry place. And John Wesley Powell, when he came out in the, the 1880s, said, oh, wow, this is a really dry place. And, and sure, maybe we can get some agriculture out of this by taking the water out of these water towers and, and irrigating the valleys, but uh, also that it might be fairly unreliable because year to year variability in the precipitation in those places. And now we've taken things that are on the edge and pushed that edge a bit. Uh, and so we've seen ecosystems moving up the mountains more, you know, retreating to the, the slightly more resilient places. It's just that process of transitioning from the very dry edge and seeing that dry edge move up in more damp places. There have also been some other changes that are just particular to the dynamics of moisture transport in the West, you know, relative to the Pacific Ocean and how that set of sea surface temperatures out there is driving things. And then there are certainly dynamics that go on in ocean temperatures internal to the earth where the West gets dry and wet, that variability. And that pushes things to quite dry at times. When we look at that Denver climatic record into the past, it, it's certainly gotten dry. And we've certainly had periods of huge wildfires spread across the West in the past. And now we've added on top of this sort of low frequency, a very constant trend. And so now rather than just having simple cycles of drying and wetting that might be decades long, you've got this imposed pattern that those cycles are playing out on top of. And the two together are producing extremes that just, again, haven't been seen in either instrumental or uh, dendroclimatic records as well. You also mentioned something like the, with the frequency of the extreme fire um, will happen like more and more frequent. Could you define what is exactly like a extreme fire and what's not so extreme? It's a little bit hard to define in those specific terms. So certainly the size and area of fire, the amount of wildfire burning across the West in a given year, we're now seeing millions and millions of acres burning in a given year. And that's, that's extreme compared to what we've seen for most of the instrument record. Certainly in the early part of the 20th century, there were some dry spells and dry years in there where there were millions of acres burning before fire suppression was involved. And when there were periods in the climate that were a bit drier, say in the uh, 1930s, with that, the Dust Bowl drought that affected quite a bit of the West all in one time. And there have been mega droughts in the past where there have been a lot of wildfires occurring on the landscape as well. But these are rare in the, the long record of time. And so that's the upshot of the story there is how rare it is, is the, the definition of extreme. And so many millions of acres or in the, a few millions of acres might have been a more normal one, but it also would have occurred more in low elevation stands. So the places where we have been successful in the past in suppressing wildfires, in part because the fuel accumulations there hadn't been as high. And now that the fuel accumulations there have gotten high, uh, it's harder to suppress fires in those places. And the drought that's been occurring has amplified the effects of the, the suppression, past fire suppression on those fuels. So we're seeing extremes both at high elevation now where fire has rarely burned in the past, and except when conditions are extraordinarily dry. We're seeing it on the west side of the Cascades, which is a very wet area, and we're now seeing some fires traveling through there. And it certainly occurred there in the past. Uh, and they tend to be very big fires because there's a lot of fuel because it grows for a long time in a very moist environment. Trying to get back to your question on you know, what's extreme, many millions of acres is extreme compared to what we're experienced with, but also the setting and the kind of fire has been much more severe than might have been in those millions of paper, millions of acres that would have occurred in the past, which might have been associated more with uh, the low fire that you're asking about earlier in the dry forest types. And so if we're expecting those to burn every seven years or so, that we're still going to be looking at millions of acres, but not millions of acres of huge forest change, mm -hmm. but millions of acres of fuels on the ground being burned and uh, disposed of so that they no longer pose a hazard towards getting the more extreme fires. A lot of my concern you know, about the future is we need fire and we need fire, especially these low elevation stands and maybe some of the higher elevation because they're transitioning into a new ecosystem. Mm. And we need to maintain the, the fuel conditions in there. And there's going to be 
pushback and saying, no, this is fire. Fire is bad. Mm -hmm. And not all fire is the same. But all fire produces smoke. And smoke really does bother a lot of people, including me. I get a response to smoke. And we get a lot of it here in Boise nowadays when the uh, Cascades and California burn and blow their smoke this way. I think a future of fires with lots of fire and pretty frequent at lower elevations is a very different story than what we're seeing now. And so we should be thinking, trying to help people understand that in the future, we will still have a lot of acres of fire, mm. but less severe and maybe not as long lasting smoke events. But the smoke is something that really does hit people pretty hard. Mm. And um, what was interesting was in, I guess it was 2016, 17, I was working on a national climate assessment with colleagues. And a lot of them were from Seattle and California and Oregon on the west side of the Cascades. And I kept talking about wildfire smoke and how bad it was. And at that point, for you know the last 10 to 15 years, Boise had been receiving so much smoke that even, you know, and I finally summarize it as they're shutting down football games for kids and football practices. So this is how it's affecting, you know, individuals, uh, because the smoke levels were so high. And it was happening several times each year. So it wasn't just, it was an extended period of time and it was happening over, but my colleagues from, from Western Oregon and Western Washington were going, oh, I, I, we can't imagine it's that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. And so we only got a little bit of information from there. Like it was kind of a niche uh, boutique thing there for the uh, interior West. And then the fires and the smoke hit there, the, the smoke out of British Columbia. And they're like, oh, oh, we get it. <laughs> this is bad. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of local people have pushed back against fuel management and mm -hmm. keeping those fires burning at low elevations for years because the smoke is bothersome. Um, mm -hmm. But we're going to have to figure out how to adapt to a future with a bit more smoke and hopefully smoke from the, the lower fires is a lot less affecting than these really, you know, when you burn so many acres of lots of fuels. A wildfire is something that's an accident, mm -hmm. but a prescribed fire is something that right. somebody sets. Right. And those have really different contexts. Yeah. Uh, we, we can all avoid responsibility for the wildfire, but you know somebody <laughs> lights the match <laughs> yeah that lights the prescribed fire and mm -hmm. but in the southeast they've been doing it for quite a while now and mm -hmm. very successfully on private lands and uh, certainly prior to this the indigenous population mm -hmm. used wildfire quite a bit so i think it'll just be a, a learning process uh, and climate change is really pushing the issue quite a bit a lot of the places people are concerned about <laughs> are also at higher elevations, so around where people live. So, and some of that will continue to be lodgepole pine and subalpine for people like living in those high elevation places. And they're gonna move there because they're cooler and a lot more pleasant in a changing mm -hmm. climate. And there, you know, the ecology may not match what we want it to look like. And so we're gonna go in there and thin to try and uh, protect those communities. And that's a different kind of management than managing for a self-sustaining ecosystem. Mm. So we're going to have all of all of the above are going to be involved. Uh, but fire use is going to be a part of all of it. I think this explains how important education, something like what we're doing now is so important. The disturbance is part of the story. And we've learned in the West that when you stop fire altogether, the trees that you came to there to enjoy and to love, especially around the sequoias, and they've mm. had to do a lot of work there since, so the uh, a lot of smaller trees grew up underneath them and put them at big risk, mm. as well as stole water and nutrients from them. Uh, but those kinds of stands and the ponderosa pine are all maintained by fire before we started suppressing it. Could you just uh, define what a serotonous cone is? You had mentioned it with the lodgepole sure. forests. So that, that's an interesting adaptation that trees have developed over time. So lodgepole pine and some other species of pine, jack pine amongst them, have developed cones where there are resins between the, what are called the bracts of the cone. So there's little layers. And between those layers, there's seeds. In most 
pine cones, those open up. So we see the, the sort of solid cones sitting there in the, the spring. And then as the, the year goes on and into the fall, we see those petals come apart and the seeds pop out uh, and fall on the floor and grow new trees at some stage. And in, that certainly happens in ponderosa pine stands and sugar pine and some other related things. And then small wildfires come through and burn those out. In the lodgepole pine, which are those thin barked ones, they don't want to spread the seeds because fire is such a rare visitor there. And so the feed, seeds fall on the ground. Eventually they might open up. There's some variation in that. And But animals will get to those seeds. They're good food. They find their way in. <laughs> But the serotony is just this, the resin that holds it together. Now, if those cones are on the tree and a wildfire comes through, it heats that resin, softens it, and then the cone falls on the ground and it pops out into fresh available soil and the tree establishes, then it is able to establish, which is really important when you're talking, you know, when you get in those high elevation burns, they burn very big areas all at once. So there's no seed trees along the edge that, carry seeds into that space. Rather, it's those cones that drop that then help that species uh, re-propagate right in the same place. And certainly this is a big concern for how do the forests evolve into the future. If we only have big wide burns and the lodgepole pine are adapted to that, then they come up again and they're still adapted to rare but wide fires. Mm -hmm. And if the conditions are now drier, they're going to keep doing that without the trees getting all that big mm. <laughs> and your cycle might be very fast. And so where managers can help is saying, Oh, let's help convert this. And they can only do a little bit at a time into a stand where fire is a more frequent visitor with species that can handle with thick bark pine, the less frequent cycles. And so this is a question of the ecology of cones that are serotonous versus other cones uh, and the fires that tend to go with those species and the nature of those fires and transitioning gracefully as opposed to the chaos that might ensue because there's still be plenty of water to grow large pole pine. Uh, it's just, we'll get <laughs> the uh, more frequent fires coming through because of more frequent droughts. So Charlie, when are we going to see pine trees in the North Pole? <laughs> <laughs> well, that thankfully is an ocean up there. But yeah, it's a good question as far as the, the tree line moving north. I like to joke every so often, one of my employees uh, used to work for the Icelandic Forest Service. And he said, yeah, it was about an acre of trees <laughs> on the north edge of the island someplace. And I used to work as a tour bus driver along the Hall Road between Fairbanks and Prudhoe Bay. And as you're along there, they say, there's a little sign that says, this is the last tree. And... <laughs> <laughs> Knowing when that when that last tree moves a little further north uh, is a good question, but the rate of warming up in the north is higher. What a lot of people don't realize is how dry the Arctic is, and so maybe this will, I think some moistening comes along with the warming air can hold more moisture, but it'll be that balance that'll be interesting for the the moving in trees. You know, frost is certainly an important impediment <laughs> to the trees and. Mm -hmm. But it's at some stage, they're also going to hit a moisture balance issue as well. So, Charlie, on one of your graphs, there was a mesic forest. It was M-E-S-I-C. Can you explain yeah. what that is? Yeah, and sometimes pronounced mesic as well. Mm -hmm. uh, damp forest. So the initial pictures that I showed you were the dry forest. And then near the end, I showed you a picture of a cold forest. And music means damp forest, and it's what's in between. It's usually more of a mixture of species that you might find in both settings. Things like Douglas fir, still some ponderosas, some grand firs, other firs that are less adapted to large snow loads, and sometimes the, the lodgepole. So you see a, a mix in through there of species, and sometimes those will burn in at moderate severity and sometimes at high severity. Fire is not a very frequent visitor, but it's more common than it is at the higher elevations. And very rarely does it go through with the sort of low severity type of burn, although it might, there might be patchy habitats in there that do that. But it's, it's a space in between, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Easiest way to characterize it. So is it fair to say that with the climate change not getting any better anytime soon, 
is it most likely that it's probably going to change our landscape? Yes. And, and a lot of the challenges that, although everything's getting warmer, most areas are also getting drier and wetter. So we have the more extreme moisture and more extreme dry, you know, long dry spells. Those are kind of unique habitats. <laughs> uh, uh, there aren't a lot of parallels to what we have. So our understanding and expectations about what should grow in those environments isn't as clear. You know, the, in the past used to be things that kind of went hand in hand with each other. Cold meant damp, you know, high elevation, snowy, uh, wetter places with less evaporation. But now we're seeing, you know, long droughts at high mm -hmm. elevations. Even if it is evaporating slower, things eventually get dry enough to burn. Mm -hmm. I think we will, as managers and scientists, have a big challenge in front of us, understanding what kinds of ecosystems might be stable in those areas. I think above all, what people value in these landscapes, and we've just recently published a nice paper describing this challenge, what is stability. So people like to see the forests as they have seen them, and we want to see something more stable, something that we, the, we, when we go to visit that forest, we want to see, show our kids that same forest. We want to take our grandchildren fishing in the same lakes and streams that we always have. And our businesses need stability. You know, ski areas depend on there being snow. Uh, trout shops, fishing shops depend on there being trout <laughs> in those streams, although I suppose they can switch over to bass fishing. Uh, but it's you know, some sense of things being either as they are, or if they cycle, cycling around something that's stable. Yeah. So sure, forest, a few forests burn down here and there, but I can still go to a general area and expect to see my forest, not the whole landscape completely disrupted or converted to shrublands. And that's the, the big question about climate change is whether it will bring us a new stable state uh, or not. And while it's transitioning, it's going to be very hard to understand where we're going. Charlie, thank you for your expertise and knowledge in helping us understand uh, what effect climate change may have on forests and trees. So I appreciate that very much. Great. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for watching this video. I hope it's uh, given you some insight into climate change and the effects on forests. And we look forward to your participation in our next video.